Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. So today we have an invited speaker, Alicia Fornes. So she is an expert in handwritten document analysis and she will present her latest research. Alicia is a senior research fellow at the Computer Vision Center CVC at the University of Barcelona, Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, UAB. She has more than 100 publications in international conferences and journals. She participated in many research and technology transfer projects related to the recognition of handwriting documents. She received the IAPR ICTA Young Investigator Award in 2017 for outstanding contributions in the recognition of handwriting text and graphics with high impact to the field of digital humanities. So you could say Alicia is one of the rising stars of the field. Her research interests include historical document image analysis and handwriting recognition, as well as optical music recognition. So you see that she has a broad variety of methods that she will present today. And the presentation is entitled Computer Vision Applied to Historical Handwritten Documents, Opportunities and Challenges. Alicia, thank you very much for accepting the invitation to our small seminar here. And I'm very much looking forward to your talk. So the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation and let's hope that we see each other face to face soon. We'll see. It's hard. So uh, the first thing that I that I would like to mention is just a couple of sentences uh, concerning the Computer Vision Center. So we are in Barcelona. Uh, so it started as a consortium by the Catalan government at the UAB, Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. And we are more than 100 people in computer vision. So there is uh, the line in mobility, transportation, autonomous um, driving. We have also health, welfare, medical image analysis. So I know that you are also working in this. There are also industrial systems. This is very related to tech transfer. And we have the part of the media contents and of course, uh, document analysis, this reading uh, systems. And we are quite a big group, uh, many doctors, many students, and we work in many uh, different um, aspects. So different kinds of documents and also different kinds of tasks. So you will see that there are some um, people appearing here and there in different publications, just to show that we are uh, quite a big group. And this is not just my own uh, research. So concerning documents, um, I'm uh, very focused on uh, handwriting uh, recognition, and this can appear in historical documents. This is related to cultural heritage, of course, and digital humanities. Just uh, to mention that still there is a work, a big work to do, because there are many documents, even in Europe, that are not yet digitized, just imagine, transcribed, recognized, classified, or indexed. So the, the work is titanic. And then in the case of uh, modern documents, it may seem that everything goes by mail, but not yet. There are still many documents in paper. So it just this is a crash, this is an accident. Uh, and this is just the, the document that's filled in. So there are many documents that still have a uh, handwritten annotation and need to be processed. So concerning document image analysis and recognition, we have many different tasks. So the, and I, I just a short overview before going into the recognition, which is the, the part that I would like to focus uh, today. Um, the first thing that we have is enhancement. So we have these binarization and enhancement uh, tasks 
which are very important in case of very degraded documents. This is a microfilm. This is an example of the images that we work with in some projects. The original is lost, dust disappeared, so no more uh, paper. So we only have this uh, microfilm and we are just trying to enhance and increase the legibility, the readability of the documents. We also have the typical recognition, transcription. We have an image and this is the kind of OCR for handwriting. We could also have the layout analysis, detecting which are the different parts in the document that are text or graphics or symbols or pictures. We also have keyword spotting, very famous. So we have a word and we would like to search this word into a collection. And we also have lately some work in um, extracting the content. So the transcription, the recognition is not so important. In this case, what we are interested in is in detecting which are the name entities, the names, the surnames, the uh, occupations, the places, the dates. So we also, um, if we go uh, beside uh, recognition, we could also think in completely different tasks, such as classification or forensics. In this case, we have some examples of writer identification and verification. So in here, the content is not the interesting part. The interesting part is who. So who wrote this? And in this case, it's not what, it's more how it's written so that we can have the style. And the style is uh, applied to text, but of course the style can be also applied to other kinds of um, um, documents. In this case, we could see music scores or even these signatures or even these uh, paintings. Instead of writer identification or verification, we could also think in dating. And dating can be seen as a zoom in or a zoom out perspective. Zoom in, I mean by the same person. In this case, we have uh, Richard Nixon. And it's the evolution of the handwriting within the same individual. So it was at the very beginning and it was later. These are manuscripts from Bach. And they also want to know if this is from the early stage, it was for the, from the late stage. Or we could think in zoom out in the sense that I think in centuries. So how the evolution of the handwriting over the different centuries. Um, in this case, we had, uh, these are Swedish charters and these are documents from monks. And they are also analyzing, there is a, a, a very interesting project in Sweden about this, how the handwriting was evolving during the different centuries. So we have zoom in, zoom out. We also have other kinds of documents that also deserve attention. And just as an example, we have uh, Pianola Rolls. It was the digital, let's say, digital uh, CD, let's say. Um, and we have recordings uh, from people and we also have the scores in here. So what we also do is uh, that we work in some kind of OCR for this. So some recognizers. So instead of Braille, we have these codes to interpret. And in the end, all this can be uh, read and recognized. And then we have some kind of audio file that we can listen to. And uh, we also have a line in photographs. So in this case, we have historical photographs with an agreement with the Catalan government. And there are uh, thousands of historical photographs in the archives that need to be somehow classified, uh, organized, or accessed in a, in a way. So in here, we have an example of how we see this cloud of photographs and how we can search in here or how we can cluster and group by similarities. And in this case, what we have is that we could try to do some uh, description of the of the image, this image captioning. We could also try to identify the different objects in the image object detection, object recognition from computer vision. We could also have some tagging with the, with the percentage of confidence for each one. We could also go for 
painting in colors, this coloring of the images. We could also try to identify the different faces so that we can search for some people in the collection. And of course, we could also think in dating. As we said, with the handwriting, we could also go for this dating with the pictures, with the photographs. So now let's, let's focus a bit on handwriting recognition. So, and let's, let's see, first of all, why is this uh, so difficult? So it's true that it's not OCR. Uh, in this case, the different characters are different. Uh, and in some cases, the handwriting style is complicated, especially if you go to the old times. Just for your information, this is Catalan. And to me, the first time that I saw this uh, marriage record, uh, I didn't know if that was a Latin alphabet or both. So we have very different handwriting styles from the writer and also from the uh, century, the style in that age. And we also have the typical elastic deformations of the handwriting. So no uh, characters are exactly the same. We also have the same um, with text and also with handwritten uh, symbols. So we are, for example, here we have some examples of um, music symbols. And of course, we have the segmentation problem. We don't know when each one of the characters starts or ends. So we have all these uh, difficulties on the table. And we know that in the last uh, decades, there were um, many techniques, we could call them classical techniques, um, right now, which are the typical hidden Markov models at the very beginning. Recognition was using hidden Markov models. There were also SBMs. There were back of uh, words. We also had this canonical correlation, trying to correlate the uh, descriptor of the content with the images. We also had uh, graph-based approaches. In the end, all of them were trying to do exactly the same. So trying to learn, which is the appearance in pixels, which is the transcription, so the label, the, the character. But then um, there was a breakthrough paper, the BLSDMs, and everything started to move faster. And then CNNs came and the combination with CNNs and LSTMs. And then we had all this revolution of deep learning applied to uh, the recognition of handwritten documents. So we started with these BLSDMs. I will not uh, spend time on, on this. And we also had even these um, CNNs that try to extract features. And then from these features, then we have all the preprocessing and uh, in the end, the transcription. And this was evolving. And all these combinations of LSTM, multidimensional LSTM, CNNs plus LSTMs and all this. So there was also another uh, step which were the encoder, decoder architectures from NLP. Uh, this sequence to sequence paradigm was um, basically at the very beginning for uh, translation. So we have the input text, and then in here we have the condensed information of what I've seen so far. And then from this, I start the decoding. It was very useful in the case of um, translation. And then there were some uh, attempts to move this into the image and uh, vision part. So in this case, what we have is the input text line, and then we go into this encoder. We have this attention layer so that we know in which part of the image we should look at at every particular point. And then from this, we have the decoder. Just as an example here, all this gray part is just showing where, where the, the attention mask is located for reading each one of the characters in the decoder part. So, so far they look promising. Um, and what else? There are, again, from the NLP world, uh, the transformers. So the transformer networks are also very popular uh, nowadays. And the idea is to get rid of this recurrent uh, neural networks, and we start going into more, let's say, into a bigger architecture. Of course, this is a much bigger architecture, but in this case, what we have 
is multi-head attention. So the idea, and let me just explain this uh, in here. The idea is that when I am analyzing each one of the parts in the image or in the text line right now, I have the possibility to look at different parts so that uh, I can have, let's say, context from different parts. So more in a zoom in and even more in a zoom out. Way. So thanks to this uh, multi-head uh, attention, the different parts in the, in the text can be uh, processed at the same time. So we tried and we explored uh, this idea for recognition. So this is this big uh, architecture. But in the end, the idea is that we can have from each part of the image, we can have this possibility of looking at different uh, parts in the, in the text line. And thanks to this, we can see again that we have the different attention when um, trying to recognize. So the good thing is that this is close to all this uh, parallelization, which is uh, good. The negative part is that the architecture gets really big. So that would be one possibility. We'll see how far we can go. And then the second possibility would be this uh, field called uh, geometric deep learning, which is this graph neural networks with all this um, idea of instead of a pixel, what we have is a node in a graph. So the typical convolution that we know is a convolution that's applied to each one of the nodes with the neighboring um, nodes. So in this case, we explore this idea for uh, handwriting, but in this case for um, classification. So we are just comparing the different images so that uh, we can know if they are the same or not. So it would be closer to what a spotting in this case. And even some people think uh, and some researchers claim that transformers, somehow this multi-head attention, this possibility of looking at different parts of the image can also be seen as these connections between nodes in a graph. So we could see here and there so that we can have this um, information during the message passing step. So it's nice, but again, we'll see how far we can go. And of course the architecture gets bigger. So till now, what we have is recognition, transcription. But is this enough for all the different applications that we have on the table? And this is one of the projects that we are working um, uh, currently at the CBC, which is this creation of this uh, social network, this historical social network. And what we have in this case are different kinds of population documents, and we have to extract the information. I remember at the very beginning when we started working in this, that um, the demographer um, came and said that uh, they needed uh, some help, some automatic transcription in here. But uh, I still remember this very clearly. Uh, she said that she was interested in creating the database with all the information so that you can create this social uh, network, everybody connected. So she was not interested in the transcription. So I don't want a TXT file or a, a doc uh, file with all the transcribed text. What I need is to fill my database. So I need, in this case, that this is a name, this is a surname, and that person was married to that um, woman. So uh, in this case, it's not transcription. So we need some kind of understanding. So we thought in uh, having this language model, but in this case, some category semantic language model. So what we know in this case, which are uh, structured documents. So we have here an example in where uh, we have the name and surname of the man, the occupation, the place. And then in here, we start having the information of the woman. So the name and surname and occupation in this case of the woman and all the extra uh, information. If they were from, I don't know, what particular town and blah, 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 on that date they married. So since we have this, let's say, context, uh, we could have this uh, 
recurrent uh, BLSTM in here so that we could process. And it's very common that after the name, a surname comes. So thanks to this, we were able to start getting some semantics of what we were reading. But again, we need the different words, we need the different paragraphs, and we also have this in different uh, steps. So we have the category, which is the name, surname, occupation, date, and blah, blah, blah. And we also have another module that was the recognition, the transcription one. And of course, we also need at the very beginning to take each one of the paragraphs and then create each one of the segment, each one of the text lines and each one of the words. So we have three different things for just extracting this. And that's why this idea of uh, joint or multitask architecture uh, came, came in. In this case, what we would like to have is a joint approach that just does everything. So we have the input page. So no text line, no paragraph, no words uh, are segmented. So we could get rid of this part. And the network is just capable, or we try to be capable of everybody, of everything. So we have at the very beginning this um, ResNet. Uh, to extract the different features. And in here, what we have are three different regions, so three different flows. So the first branch is the one that says if it's a name entity or not. The second one is the one that says where, so this region of the image. And the third branch is for the transcription. So if we have enough training data, what we can have is a single integrated architecture that does everything. So we have here as an example of the output so that we can have the different bounding boxes with the transcriptions and the different colors mean the different um, name entity tags. So in the end, what we have is that combining the different document image analysis methods, we could take uh, document, we could analyze the layout of the document. We could have the different words in the document so that we can create the different text lines. And then from this, we could extract the name entities and we could also extract the different transcription. So we did this uh, with the demographic uh, researchers so that the system was somehow able to analyze by themselves the document and then start filling the form. Again, in here, we are not interested in the transcription. They are interested in filling the database. But everything is very fine, very beautiful, very nice, but how much can we trust what we do? Again, they are very interested in creating this social network. So they need to know that the information is correct. That's the, that's the thing. So if we, even though, even more, we think in combining different kinds of documents, so the probability of having some errors is high. So when we try to create, in this case, the historical social network, even by aggregating some other kind of data, it's very important that in this information extraction, we have um, the, the data as good as possible, as correct as possible so that we can start with the linkage. If we start linking information that it's not correct, then of course the result is not good. In this case, we are trying to work in the validation in here and gamification will be something that I will explain just in a minute. And then of course, from this, what we have is that uh, even researchers in um, uh, social mobility, researchers, immigration researchers, in genealogy, all of them can work from uh, this data. In the end, we have this intelligent, intelligent browser so that we can visualize everything. It's a kind of Facebook thing. So I was mentioning the quality of the data. So we are very proud as researchers very proud. So we are doing good work. We, we are showing with our data sets that our methods are improving the state of the art. And in the end, it's 
nice. We have the publication and we also have these tools that we uh, uh, prepare and develop for the users. But in the case of the demographers, for them, the data uh, quality was crucial because we need to ensure that everything that we do here, handwriting recognition, spotting, or name entity recognition is correct. So in, the, in this case, what we had is this crowdsourcing and game sourcing. We had these video games in here so that we know that the data has been validated by a user before, con, um, before creating all the different links and before integrating all the data into the uh, knowledge database. And instead of having many people just looking at the text, we thought that maybe with some video games, it was must, much fun. The, the idea was that I can play this just thinking uh, Candy Crush or Angry Birds or something like this. That's a mini game that I just play for 10 minutes and that's it. So let's imagine that I can have something that's also fun and then it helps somehow to validate the data. So in the end, we assume that what we have is the, um, uh, the different uh, person uh, linked to each other in the database. So we have this uh, social network. And then what we created was this uh, tool for visualizing everything. So we have the different, it's a very similar to a Facebook page. So we have the different uh, person and then we can see the links to the other uh, people. So the parents, the, the sons, um, and then we also know uh, the place where they lived. And then in here, we can visualize all the information. So citizens can uh, check if they have ancestors in the data set, and then they can see where they lived and things like that. And also, of course, scholars for their studies. So, so far it's okay. But again, we said deep learning is nice. We can do many, many different things, but we need the user to validate the data. But anyway, we had a lot of data labeled to train these models. What happens if it's not the case? And now, just as, a, as an example, I don't know why, but text has been um, researched for um, centuries. There are many, that's also true. But in the case of music scores, we are thinking in the artistic, in the musical, uh, part of Europe. And we know that still there are many handwritten music pages in archives. Just as, as an example, uh, Liceu, this is the Opera House in Barcelona, has thousands of pages. And in some cases, the composition is known. And in some cases, the composition is not yet known. And the same happens with churches around um, Spain. So um, we know that transcription, again, is tedious and costly. So in this case, instead of this OCR, what we have is OMR, which is the music recognition part. So the idea is to start from a handwritten music score. And then what we would like to have is the audio or the transcription so that we can listen to that. And we started at the very beginning because, of course, the nature of music is not exactly the same as the nature of um, music. In this case, what we have is a note can be up or down depending on the melody. And then also we have the rhythm, which also different. So we thought in two different outputs in this network, the CNN, LSTM, in which we had the rhythm and then we have the pitch. So it was fine. But this is not prepared for, um, uh, let's say, reading different parts in parallel. So let's think in polyphonic music, for example, in chords. So we were exploring this sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence architecture, but in this case, we were reading, as we can see in here, so in vertical and in horizontal way. So we start reading this and then we read the different primitives and then we jump to the next one, reading the different primitives so that we are somehow closer to, the, um, to reading shorts or polyphonic music in this case. The idea was we have an encoder with attention and we have the decoder. In the end, what we are um, uh, outputting here are the, the sequence of uh, graphical primitives that we have been reading. 
But even though uh, with these sequence to sequence uh, methods, uh, the bigger the architecture, and this is true, the more parameters. So we need data to train. So there is no data uh, and the mini data sets that we can find in music scores are not handwritten or uh, even less if they are old, which is this old handwriting style of music scores. So one of the possibilities is uh, to create some more data from the uh, few uh, label data that we have. So in this case, we were just working with the typical warping effect that we can find spe specifically in old uh, documents, or we could also think in just emulating the paper uh, filling. Or we could even go even farther and we just directly generate synthetically uh, the different uh, appearances of the text. So we have different type fonts and then we can also emulate the background paper. And since everything is synthetic, of course, we know where the different uh, words are located and also even the different characters. So we can even uh, use this for many different texts. But again, Synthetic data is not exactly the same as real data. We can see some examples. This is eh, the appearance is not exactly the same as this one. So we need, in any case, we need to bridge the gap between the synthetic and the real. And, and to reduce this domain gap, what we thought is in um, going into some adaptation of this. So we were seeing that in computer vision, uh, there were some unsupervised domain adaptation for images, uh, like, in, like in here. But in our case, we have uh, text. And text is not just a, an image of a symbol or, a, or an image of a character. What we have is a sequence of characters. So what we needed is something that was able to adapt to sequences. And the architecture that we uh, explored was the following one. What we have is this uh, synthetic images. So we have uh, different type fonts. And in here, we have generated different um, words, millions if necessary, because we can generate as many as we want with some distortions. And this goes into the encoder. And then, of course, this is the, the recognizer part, which is the decoder for the recognition. So the, the sequence to sequence architecture that we have seen. But the interesting part is this one, which is the discriminator. So we are playing this game, trying to fool the discriminator, who says if this is the source or this is the target data. The target data is the real data, of course, unlabeled. So we don't have the transcription of this. But just by playing, playing this mini game, so the encoder is modifying the, the parameter so that still recognizes in this, in this case and tries to fool the discriminator. So thanks to this, we were able to adapt to the different um, handwriting styles. For example, in here, what we have is uh, French, we have German, and we have some English and some Catalan. And what we see in here is that at the very beginning, the recognizer is doing quite a mess, so not very uh, well. But after playing this game with some real data, but no labels, no, no, let's not forget this, we were adapting the style somehow in the, in the encoder so that we can recognize in a better way. But there is something interesting here. So we see here the different data sets and we see what's happening if we have real data, real labeled data. So we can see that the um, recognition rate is very good. So we have a character rate, which is uh, very nice. If we only work with synthetic data, it's quite a disaster, you see that. If we play with this unsupervised adaptation, then we see that the reduction is significant. But again, is this reduction enough? Again, we can see that from four, we can reach 16. Of course, we are uh, 10 points less, but still we are far. So the, the message that we, that we could see here 
as a as a take home message is that it's fine with unsupervised adaptation we can go closer but still far away from a satisfactory performance in some cases since these catalan words are very different from the synthetic ones we still see that 20 percent of collateral rate is not very good so Let's try to, re, uh, to create some realistic data that look like the data in the test. So um, one of the most um, preliminary works in this generation of handwriting was uh, some years ago in SIGGRAPH in 2016. My text in your handwriting is very nice. There was um, some manual intervention in the process but it's true that the, the result that they got was quite nice, quite realistic in this case. But again, some user intervention. So we tried to avoid the, the user intervention so that we could generate, render these artificial uh, words. In this case, uh, we have been generating words and um, the ones that are real are just the ones in, in, in green. The other ones are generated by the model. So it looks realistic, quite realistic. So which was the, the architecture behind? What we have is images of words and we have here the encoding uh, text. So we have the text. I would like to write this with, with this handwriting style. So we have the style in here. We have the content, which is the string that I would like to write in here so that the generator can have both things and he can, uh, it can create this word. But how we know that this word is okay? First, we have the discriminator that says real, fake, real, fake. But is this enough? No. We need some writer uh, identification uh, classifier that says, yeah, yeah, this word looks like this handwriting style or not, because we are trying to have something that really mimics some particular handwriting style. And then we have the third module, which is the one that says, okay, it can look like this handwriting style, but anyway, I need to be able to read the content that I have in here. That's why we have the recognizer. So as a result, what we had is the possibility to modify which is the string, and then we can have the different handwriting styles. As an example, we have writer A, writer B, we can see that the real e image is different. We have a different handwriting style and we can control how far we go from writer A to writer B. Since we also control the content, we can also change in this case, one character uh, per time so that we can evolve and create the different words that we are interested in. So what we have is the possibility uh, to generate a lot a lot of handwritten data. But the question is, can we uh, use all this for improving HDR? Because we can see this as a um, graphical beautiful uh, word in, from um, the, the visual appearance part, but I would like to know if this can really improve HDR. So indeed, we did some uh, variation to this architecture just to try to extract the content, which is the string in here, and we could extract the style, which is the, the style of the handwriting. And then in this case, what we had is the same architecture at the very first uh, part, which is the recognizer, which is this uh, recognition module. But in here, what we have is another input, which is another word. So we have two images. So the image in which we are concentrated in the content, which is the string. The, and in here, we are interested in the style. And thanks to this, we can combine all this so that, as you can see here, we could try to take this word and this word, and then we can go and generate combinations. I would like to have this word in this particular style, 
or I would like to have this in the other particular style, which is this one. And thanks to this, we can generate different handwritten words just by pairs. So the content of this goes into the style of the other one or the other way around. And then we tried um, this for generating data and we compare with the methods that we had. In the end, we see that, yeah, it improves. It's not a very big improvement, but it helps to the HDR. So in the end, we can see that all this synthetic uh, generation of data, that augmentation synthetic generation, it's fine because it really helps to the, to the training stage of the HDR. So, so far it's still fine. We can uh, train all these deep learning methods, but what happens if this is still not possible? So what happens if I don't know what I'm recognizing? What's happening if I don't know the alphabet, if the alphabet is invented? And this goes into the, um, this decrypt project. So what we have here are encoded uh, uh, documents. Uh, each one is a different alphabet. In this case, it's digits with some clear text in the middle. In here, we have invented alphabet. In here, we have another invented alphabet because all this is the secret messages that uh, was trying just to, to hide the contents. So we can think in diplomatic correspondence or correspondence between secret uh, societies. So. In this case, and what we have is a multidisciplinary uh, team uh, in which we have the computer vision uh, researchers that work together with linguistics and with cryptanalysis so that in the end, because transcription is just the first part in this change. Uh, so what we have in the, in the chain is that we go towards this transcription and later the cryptanalysis uh, and the decryption process will try to break the code and discover which is the secret message. But again, transcription is difficult. And why it's difficult? First, because we don't know what we are reading, no idea. Each one of the manuscripts can have a different uh, alphabet invented. Um, in some cases, Symbols are hard to segment. I don't know if these are two or this is just one with uh, two loops. I have no idea. Even in some cases, like in this one, uh, experts are not uh, do not agree in the size of the alphabet but it, because it happens that in some cases, some particular symbol is not a character in the alphabet. It's just a name entity. For example, this symbol means the Pope or this symbol means the king, things like that. So they don't even know how is the, um, the alphabet. And of course, very few or zero data to train. And of course, we don't know the language, we don't know uh, anything. So there is no dictionary or there is no language model available that we could uh, use. So we explored a very unsupervised uh, method that was just trying to segment in a completely unsupervised way, so learning free method, the different uh, symbols. And then we were just clustering each one of the symbols. So we had the different groupings. And of course, there were many symbols that are in the middle. And, and that's why we had this label propagation step. So we were creating in here, we can see one cluster, another cluster, and these symbols that are just a bit in the middle of nowhere. So just thanks to this label propagation that was iteratively uh, run, we were propagating the labels so that we could in the end um, label all symbols in the, in the manuscript. Of course, if there are some disagreements, we can decide to transcribe, that's pos uh, possible, or we just leave this untranscribed, which is this symbol here so that we can ask the user to finalize the transcription. So there is not an agreement in here in here. That's why we have this missing symbol, so unknown symbol. So this means that the system is not confident enough for transcribing this. And we also have this um, web-based interactive tool that helps 
in this uh, transcription process. And we can have two possibilities here, and I would like to mention this because it will be important later, which is the user intervention. So the user can check the different clusters and can see if there are some uh, symbols that are outlayers that do not belong to this cluster. If you clean the clusters, then it's easier that the labels that you propagate are the good ones. So somehow we have this unsupervised method and this semi-supervised method in case the user is cleaning the clusters before the level uh, propagation starts. But anyway, this is okay, but what happens if I have a lot of documents? So I would like to have something that minimizes the need of labeled data, has better performance. And of course, um, I don't want to have 20 different uh, LSTM networks. So what I would like to have is that the user says, I would like to search this because I think that these are symbols in my alphabet, and then the system searches. So what we thought is in a kind of spotting approach for uh, transcription. And of course, we don't know what we are searching. So we have some documents, but then we don't know which will be the alphabet of the test uh, pages, because every manuscript can have a different alphabet. So the idea of few shot learning is that you can train with some classes and then you can test with different classes. So we explored this idea of uh, object classification in the case of few shot. But, and we also explore the idea of uh, few shot object detection. In this case, what you are doing is just searching in the page. The good thing is that if the symbol segmentation is not very accurate, it's uh, still okay. And that's why we had this uh, architecture. We explore this architecture for the transcription of ciphers. So the idea is that we have a text line. And in this case, this text line is completely synthetic from an alphabet um, that we have. So it's not even cipher uh, documents. And we have here the support set, which is the symbol that we are searching. And we said with this attention um, uh, region proposal networks, we have the different candidates in the image. And then later with this uh, fully convolutional, um, fully connected layers as a classification, what we have is if they are similar or different to the support that we are uh, giving as an example, and of course the position. So the idea was that in the end, the system is just saying which are the places in which we have the different ones. But again, this is spotting and we are interested in transcription. So. What we had to do is to provide at least one example of each one of the symbols in the alphabet. So this is what the user is doing. One example of each one in the alphabet, at least one. And then we have the different text lines and then we search all the different symbols in the text line. And then we have this similarity matrix that once processed, we have the transcription. So in here, what we have is the training, which is synthetic, omniglot symbols. This is what we use. And then we have the test documents. We have never seen this during training. So what we had is that the unsupervised with this clustering and label propagation method that we had, well, the result, we see how is the, the result. Of course, with some user intervention helps, but still, it's, it's not super great. And with the case of the few shot, the results were not very good. So we thought in incorporating some fine tuning uh, strategy. So in the end, we have the shots plus the uh, couple, two pages that we had. And just as an example in here, we have a typical LSTM recognizer for the, for the transcription. And in here, what we see is that the results are fine or even much better in some difficult cases like this one. As we know, the more difficult is the document, the more data is needed. So that's why even in the case of multidimensional LSTMs, 11 pages is not enough. So promising, yes, user effort decreased. So just imagine asking a user to transcribe two pages instead of 11 and even having a result that's still quite okay. 
so far everything is fine but let's let's just finalize with a real use case and this is work in progress and i was just trying to incorporate this because i think that's interesting especially for the discussion which is uh, the real collaboration. Now we have been working in different research projects, but right now we have the possibility to work with a scholar in humanities, philology and paleographer uh, towards the transcription of a document that we have never seen before. In this case, it's not a cipher document. This is a runic uh, writing um, system. So all these are the different uh, runic uh, uh, letters from, from, in this case, it's from, uh, yes, Danish manuscript. And what we have are, uh, we, what we have is uh, 200 pages like this. We can see that in some cases, it's even difficult to read this. And uh, the scholar was interested in uh, transcribing this uh, manuscript. And we said, okay, let's see uh, how far we can go. Of course, of course, no label data, nothing. So we need to learn uh, how to read this manuscript. And we have been working in handwriting recognition for some years. So we know that there are different possibilities and then we explore, let's see what we can do for you. So we have the typical uh, learning base, the recurrent neural networks, LSTMs, the normal uh, the common and classical methods, but we know that we need training. So the effort uh, in transcription uh, for cre creating the training data is high. Of course, the performance is also high, of course. And the segmentation is at the line level and the scalability is high. Once we have this train model, it can, it can be applied to many others. In the case of learning free, since this is just clustering and some label propagation according to the similarity of the different characters, of course, the scalability is low. Different handwriting styles, everything goes uh, crap. In this case, the performance is moderate, but this is lovely from the user perspective. Again, we have the user right now, we are working towards something that's really useful. And that's, that's why I was interested in this part. So let's touch the real world. And then we have this meh, medium uh, performance, medium scalability um, with very low user effort. So a priori, I would say that this is the ideal case for the user, but let's see. So we had different scenarios. What happens if we ask the user two training pages to transcribe two pages or four pages or six pages? And then we see just with this data, how far we can go. And in here, I will not explain all the numbers, uh, but the interesting part, uh, again, this is work in progress. Um, what we have seen is that in the case of the multidimensional LSTM, the data, even in the case of L3, six pages, the data means that uh, it's still too few for a good performance. So it's still quite high. In the case of the unsupervised method, we know that if there is some user intervention in cleaning the different clusters, so I remove the outliers so that I'm not propagating labels that are from incorrect um, symbols. Uh, so I even don't have a big amount of question marks, which is the character that I don't know because it can be very uh, many different labels. So we know that with user intervention in the unsupervised case or few shot detection, not classification, we are uh, having more or less the best results. So this is a 7%, almost 7%, 8% uh, character error rate. So this is promising. So we said, okay. And these are some examples of the transcriptions that we could have. So we said, okay, let's go for this. So we could have the unsupervised with cluster intervention, which is this uh, clustering plus the user intervention in the case of cleaning the clusters. And we have the super nice few shot detection method in which you are segmenting a couple of examples. And then I search and transcribe the rest of the manuscript. Mm -hmm. And then we gave this to the, to the user. Uh -huh. And then we 
checked how much time is needed because in the end, again, we are you know, towards the real world. So we are really creating something that's useful for a scholar. And the transcription time in a manual transcription time takes approx 15, 16 minutes per page. So we have almost 10 minutes per transcription and five uh, for validation. So the user makes mistake, of course. And then the user was also checking that everything was properly transcribed. So let's say that uh, if everything is manual, so no computer vision, just uh, the user and the manuscript and the TXT file where everything is written, it takes approx 15, 16 minutes, more or less. And then we check what we have. In the case of the few shot classification, results are not good, discarded. In the case of few shot detection, what we see for the different pages that we had, we were transcribing uh, four pages in the test set. And we also had four pages for training, which was the, well, more or less good, good case, um, but not too much effort for the user. And then we saw that in general, we have five minutes for, uh, uh, for validating the transcription and correcting in the case of this few shot, we were four, two uh, mistakes or the last one, which was difficult to read, 33. Of course, the quality of the document is important. In the case of the unsupervised uh, clustering with user intervention, so we are cleaning the clusters before the label propagation step, uh, we have more uh, errors, but it was much easier to detect because the system was showing the parts where the confidence was not very high. So still the results were quite okay. So if I ask you right now, which is in the end the method that we propose to the user so that uh, this method can be used for transcribing the rest of the 200, let's not forget 200 runic pages because this example was just with 10 and the transcription was with four so that we know what is the best uh, for the rest of the 200 pages in the runic manuscript that must be transcribed. And now it's the part that we don't know. And we don't know how far the recommendation would be. What we have is the training uh, which is necessary. In the case of the unsupervised with user intervention, we need to check that the lines are okay, the symbols are okay. We need to clean the clusters because this is with the user intervention. And after cleaning the clusters with the validation that we have in here, we have a total time of almost two hours. In the case of the few shot detection, it looks promising. We needed those pages for uh, uh, fine tuning the method. And again, we also need to segment each one of the symbols and provide some examples of each one. And then in the end, what we had is two hours and a half. So this is the time that the user, the scholar, needs to give vote just to prepare the data then we train the algorithm as it is, and then we validate. So this time is of course incorporated in here. So it's added in here. So it's included. And then we see which is the time for the manual transcription. So in the end, since we have 200 pages, then we can say that, well, maybe you should go for this because we know that the medium, let's say the average time that we have per um, page in the validation case, it's between five or 14, depending on the, on the document. But in the case of the unsupervised uh, clustering, we have a more or less the same, but the idea is that we spend less time. So what's the best? It depends. Uh, is it really great? Well, if we think that the manual transcription is in this case, one hour, we are not so proud of our methods. So again, we see that deep learning is super great. We need data. We can go for some few shot methods. We can even think in unsupervised methods with a minimum of user intervention, but still claiming that we have a tool that can serve for everything, uh, we are still far away from this. So as a conclusion, uh, we have seen that 
deep learning is everywhere. We have different uh, methodologies right now. We don't know uh, which will be the next uh, path. And document analysis can be used for many different tasks, uh, classification, recognition. But again, data is a problem. If we don't have uh, data to train, if we don't have this domain adaptation, synthetic data generation, or future learning, of course, we would be very lost, especially when we tackle any collection in any archive. And the user feedback is very important. Just for data uh, quality, that's the, the first part, and also for helping to um, uh, train the different systems. In this case, we can think in something that's more or less uh, fun to do. And of course, the collaboration of, of all this, and I know that Andreas knows very well, thanks to the collaboration of everybody from different disciplines, we can start looking towards uh, bigger, bigger uh, challenges, just for example, like the time machine. And that's it, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. I have some applause for you. If you were here in person, we would be knocking on the table. So <laughs> I prepared this. Yes, thank you. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm very impressed. This is a lot of really cool research that you've been showing and really exciting results, in particular getting down with the training data and using synthetic data seems to be a huge help and also unsupervised methods and semi-supervised methods can really push the field ahead. And I think you're addressing really the important problems that we have, that we, we can't pay for many of these labeling studies. I mean, it's not like we're Google and we can just invest uh, having 100,000 pages transcribed and things like that. So this is this is very, very important and very impressive work. I really want to thank you for this presentation. And um, I'm, I've already seen a lot of work that we want to build on and I will share with some colleagues. And it would also be great if you uh, could share the references with me that we can put it in the description of the video, because I think that is really, really cool work that is very interesting for many of our fellow colleagues. I can, I can share the slides if you are interested. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, if you if you share the slides and uh, then then I can also take out the references and put it um, in the description. So that's cool. The, the, what I particularly like is that you seem to work very closely with the humanities and the actual users of the extracted system. So there's a lot of interaction in the work that you're doing. So how how do you get to to work so closely together? Do you have any problems uh, engaging other disciplines? Or th this, is, this is really cool how you managed to do that. Is there, is there a key how to solve these problems or how to engage better? To smile a lot and that's it. No, no, uh, just, <laughs> <laughs> but just being serious. Um, I, I know um, that I'm a bit, I don't know, I, but the, the more I work in this and related to projects, the more I like multidisciplinarity because I, I feel, and this is uh, something that um, I, I smell in many conferences. If you go, and I will, I will mention just IGDAR, just as an example. So there are many computer scientists, many. And there are some people from other disciplines, and we also start having some paleo paleographers attending and some historians attending, but th the percentage is very small. And if you go to a digital humanities conference, I've attended some of them, it's just the other way around. So there are many people from the humanities, from the different disciplines in the humanities, and then two, three people working in NLP. And then one, two, working in computer vision and document analysis. So I have the impression that we work in our, I don't know, that's our uh, neighbors in our comfort zone. Uh, and, but it, it can be seen as a, as a ghetto because in the end, we are somehow blind to, to others. And, and I, I remember that uh, just when I started the demographic, um, uh, working in the demographic project, it was an ERC uh, grant. The demographer was very clear. Uh, I'm interested in this. I need this. So I need a database. Just talking to me about character error rate, to me, 
means wood. <laughs> <laughs> so it's true that we are, uh, when we are uh, submitting papers to conferences or journals, we are very proud when we have a very good character rate. And then we are beating the, the everybody. So we are... Um, um, over the state of the art results and what a nice work and blah blah nothing because then we go to the demographers into <laughs> a real project and then they say what i don't care i have this uh need and then i even i even remember what what she said to me because i was so depressed after this uh he's uh we said i think that we can go for uh, 1992 accuracy, which means a character rate of nine or 10. That's super cool with this kind of document, right? Mm -hmm. And she said, does it mean that I need to spend one, one person just taking each one of the sentences and the words and nine are okay, but then the 10th has to be corrected every time? Do you know the amount of time that I need just for this? I don't have enough budget for this. So this is the, 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 the time where you realize that eh, we are somehow in the cloud super happy, but then when we touch the real world, then we see that, uh, that it's not so beautiful. And the same happens, and that's why I ask you to, to have the opportunity to incorporate this ongoing work with Runic. So that was a collaboration with a uh, scholar, um, a philologist, and a paleographer uh, from Sweden. And it's true, they need to transcribe, still need to transcribe the runic uh, manuscript, 200 pages. So it makes sense that it's not uh, manually done. But then we have different possibilities from different publications and different methods. But then when you start uh, analyzing all this, you see that the, the answer is not so great. Of course, still, Still, it's good to have this computer vision part because 200 manuscripts are quite a lot. But if this super few shot learning approach that looks super cool from the deep learning and computer vision and blah, 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 and then you see that the simple clustering method, clustering method, just a clustering method, a K-means method, is more or less doing the same, uh, then you realize that, uh -huh, Maybe we are, yeah, we are not not so uh, touching the ground, so the real the real world, and that's why I wanted to incorporate this because I think that is uh, um, something that it deserves some thoughts. Absolutely, and I can tell you in my experience in medical um, problems, I often had very similar experiences. Yeah, you have this fancy algorithm, and it's been put together, and you spend so much time in building it, and you're very proud of your recognition and whatever, and then you get this feedback: look, it doesn't work. <laughs> I need this to work in virtually all cases, and and not just the ten cases of your training set. Uh, so this is this is really really important. And what I also found great is that you have this wonderful user interfaces that you can then correct. And I think this is very important if you work together in an interdisciplinary way, that you also really understand what the information is relevant. And maybe even you have a couple of recognition mistakes in irrelevant words, as long as you get the entities correctly extracted, that might be still okay. So yes. really, really cool. Um, and I, I would like to also mention, and I think that you have also experienced this uh, with uh, doctors and the medical field. In some cases, uh, people are very uh, you know, open to this collaboration. And in some others, they simply say that this is uh, useless and then they are just somehow uh, not open-minded in this case. So, um, I think that in medical image analysis, in moral, it's it's multidisciplinary always. Uh, so I think that you also have this this feeling. The good thing in our case is that we have been uh, working with people from the humanities that are very open minded. So the technology is not substituting my work. Mm -hmm. So the technology is just helping me to be more efficient. Exactly. And I think that it's uh, that this is also happening. Well, you will tell in medical image analysis. It, it's exactly the same story. If you if you choose the wrong wording, people will get the impression you want to replace them. And if you make clear that you're building tools to get more efficient and safer in their assessments, then it completely changes the game. 
Hmm. Um, I, I think that's also a very relevant point. And it, uh, there's there's some colleagues out there that claim that they want to replace radiologists and so on. And I think that's not very helpful for, for conducting interdisciplinary research. If your standpoint is the job that you're doing, it's it's not necessary anyway, and we will replace it with machine learning methods in the next two years. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't really help. <laughs> no. And it's probably also not accurate. <laughs> so. Okay. So, but what I found very interesting, you, you're constructing these huge social networks and uh, from, from the past, right? Uh, and, and how do you deal with ambiguity? So sometimes if the recognition isn't sure, but sometimes it may also be hard to, to identify a person clearly. So d d is there just one past, one historical social network that is correct, or could there be alternatives? And how do you deal with that? Yeah, we, indeed, we don't know. Um, what we have is different manuscripts, and in the different manuscripts, there are even there is even information that's not accurate. It's there is a just a, I, I will just take a minute because it's it's funny uh, to express this. That we have census documents from the same town, uh, and we have the census every I don't know four or five years, and then we have the exact the same um, place. So we see which are the new members in each one of the houses. So maybe these people disappeared, maybe died, and these new are just babies because you also see the age. So even the document is, is when, we, when we talk about uh, data quality, first, the transcription, and second, if the data itself, what it's written, it's correct or not. Mm -hmm. And there was a case of one person marrying a woman but there was, I don't know, 20 years difference at the, in, the very, in the very first census that she appeared. So maybe he was married to another woman and then um, the, that was a widow and, and in the end they were married together. 20 years difference, 20 years. Uh, after, in the next census, you see that of course the age is, is you know, well, time goes by. So the, the age was four years in here but it was seven in this case. And then <laughs> you were to the other one, and then it was one year here, four years. Th that's a difference more or less between census. One year in this case, so somehow she's still very young. And then that, <laughs> that was, was six or seven more. So in four census, the difference between them became only five years. So, um, yeah, so we, 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 we even have these, uh, these problems in the, in the documents. So in the end, we have just a, a social network in which we have this information. But of course, we don't even know if the transcription is 100% correct, because even the human can make mistake when validating the data. Yes. The same happens with the transcriptions. Uh, the demographer said, if we could uh, check everything that was manually transcribed. So the validation was the machine, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, so we even, we even have this, but in any case, we, we have these this kind of problems in the, in the database. Yeah, yeah I, I remember that the genetics people also complain a lot uh, about data not being represented correctly. And uh, that sometimes the claims of parenthood are problematic. So yeah. I, I would assume that's also the case in historical data. <laughs> so, yes. So, so and, and how do you model this? Is there, is there then just one option or do you, do you have parallel versions? Or what do you think would be the best way to tackle this problem? Um, what, what we have, since we have a big graph, what we have is all the information in, in there. And when we have even the different links between people, we also have the probability. So we have a, a probabilistic linkage between people. So it can be seen, even, even the names, because the name changes. In one census, the name was written like this. In another census, the name was written like that. With all the different variations in the names and surnames, in the end of record linkage is just, well, trying to do the best as, as it can. But of course, there is a, a probability in there, which is the confidence. So it's like, let's say I'm searching information in Google 
And of course, in Google, the first items will be probably my, my good uh, responses. And the, the more I go down, uh, the less probable is that, uh, that that page is related to my search. So more or less is this information. And we also have in the social network the possibility to incorporate the information from the user. If I see that these two people are related, then I can suggest this link between the two people. And if I know that these two people are not related, so this is not the brother of that one, uh, we can also say that uh, delete this link. So in, in this kind of uh, collections, especially the ones that have many different um, sources because census is different from birth, death and marriage certificates. So we have variations in the writing of everything. And we could, we could even, because this is also something interesting, is that you see this person in here and then sometime later living in a different town and then in a different town. And then you see that even the occupation changes. So somehow I am moving because I am uh, working. So uh, at some point, everybody went to Barcelona in this case, because it, there was the boom of industry. So you in even more, you have the different probabilities. So there is nothing that we can say as completely truth. In, it's completely true. So it's, it's very likely but not super. So in the end, we have all this information with the probabilities. So, so as soon as you find some evidence for a link, you essentially add it and score it with a confidence and then uh, probably keep also the link to the evidence that created the, the connection, right? Yes, and we have two labels for the, for the links. So automatic label mm -hmm. and then manual label. So somehow we have this automatic uh, linkage so we can see that all this is done by the machine. And then uh, we have the manual label, which means that somebody uh, confirmed this or somebody created the link. So we know that the manual uh, links are probably uh, better and closer to the true, to the true uh, information in this, in this case. Mm -hmm. And probably you also need to version this because the insights may change and then you have an updated opinion on which link is more likely and so on. So yes. that's, that's really, really a tough field. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but this is just an example of uh, multidisciplinary work because in the end, I work in computer vision and everything that you are mentioning right now, it's outside computer vision. So it's well the same as in time machine. So we, we need to work together because there are so many challenges in, in here that have to be tackled together. Absolutely. And th th this is also something that some people criticize about time machine, that it's not working closely enough with the historians, but it's mostly technology driven. And I think that that is something where, yeah, I think you do absolutely brilliant work. And I think this is the way how it should be addressed. We in, try in our community. So uh, the, there is a question here on the recognition system on the HDR system. So uh, the transformers appear to have the text line length hard coded into their architecture. And humans can read text lines of practically limitless length. So RNNs could do the same. So the question is, are RNN RNNs closer to the human reading from that perspective? So what's your opinion on that? <laughs> uh, probably yes, uh, because it's true that in transformers, uh, you have a maximum length. Uh, so uh, in this case, recurrent neural networks are more free because you are processing until the end. And I think that we are um, exactly doing the same as humans. Um, but it's also true that this recurrency means that we have a recurrent model. So we, we mm. cannot parallelize in the, in the sense that we could do with uh, transformers. And it's also true that if we see this multi-head attention uh, in the case of transformers, we could see as I look at this and I look at that in the, in the NLP world, there is this typical sentence 
that uh, you have the, the subject, the verb and the predicate, and you have an action, and then you can, from the action, you can know who and what, because you have the links to every, every different part of the, of the sentence. So I think that's nice. I mean, we also think in this graph, neural networks, and this geometric deep learning that's right now exploding. I think that's very powerful to have the ability of looking here close in a zoom in my mini context and my big context so that I can go and jump far away. So um, what will be the future? I don't know. I don't know if transformers will be something that in two, three years time will disappear because something better will appear. No idea. I don't know if uh, geometric deep learning will explode or given that the system is very big, uh, then there is something that's um, better. And with deep learning, I always have the feeling that uh, we are creating big monsters for some tasks that, I don't know, maybe I, I have a tank and I just need to kill a fly. So um, I have the, the feeling that in some cases, the architecture that we have in mind is not necessary. For, for the minute, I remember the typical deep learning architecture just for classifying MNIST. Come on, MNIST from zero to nine, really? And then they are isolated, the MNIST uh, numbers. And then you see an architecture that's super big like this. And it's just the fever of having bigger architecture just because it's fine, it's good, it's, I don't know. In the case of transformers uh, and graph neural networks, I see that there are many limitations from later going into the real uh, use case. And the, the, um, the last example that I showed with the runic uh, manuscript in the end, uh, more or less, you have a simple clustering method that's more or less the same, let's say, utility as a super big architecture with few shots Come on, few short uh, learning in detection that it's uh, that has a layer for transcription, and I don't know, it's a big thing. And then in the end, you see that uh, I don't know. So if the question is, do you think that transformers still have limitations so that it will not be the future? I don't know. I don't know because I know that they are powerful, and this possibility of going in parallel is also very nice. This idea of having context that's closer and far away. Uh, it helps to remember, let's say, things and parts in the sentence, which is nice. But I also see that it's quite a big monster. So I, um, it depends. Am I, am I answering? Um, uh, my answer is not so satisfying in this case. But no, but I've, I think you bring up the relevant points. And I think that's, uh, that's perfectly fine. So it's... Uh, yeah, uh, I guess uh, uh, the the person who's asking the question will follow up in the chat if we didn't answer it correctly <laughs> to his view. No, but I think he he, he shares the same opinion because um, there's these limitations of transformers and yes. uh, yet they work very well. So this is also something that we I'm always amazed to see how how you can solve with these uh, transformers so many different tasks and also machine translation and so on. So that's uh, very impressive to see. I'm also impressed about your work on the um, music um, music character recognition or note recognition. And well, I was wondering because I'm just now I'm recording um, a lecture on speech recognition, and then it's very naturally the multimodal approaches come to my mind. So, it, it, do you think that it it could be guided in addition if you had somebody playing the music on a specific instrument for, as an additional guide to, to steer the transcription? Or can you think of like harmonic relations that certain combination of sounds just don't make sense for a human being and use that to, to guide the recognition? Is, is there stuff, probably stuff like that is already being done, right? <laughs> uh, well, I, I remember one work from, this is sound, not music, but I remember that work uh, that was very, very similar to what you are uh, saying. So there is a musician and there is the, the music. So you have the video of the musician moving and then you have the music, the, the sound that's generated. You have somebody kicking something 
And at the same time with the video, you have the sound. So somehow you are correlating the different uh, nature so that you have this uh, more, um, let's say, um, holistic uh, knowledge of the object itself. And then you so, can use attention again. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. In, I mean, the, the idea of attention, uh, I, I always think in saliency for the visual system. Because in the end, it's something that it's somehow highlighting in there, and then you look at that. So I think that's more or less the very, very similar to our um, visual system, especially with saliency. Um, in the case of music, the problem that we have, and this is a big problem, the problem that we have is that the OMR in printed, it's more or less solved. It's like OCR, except very old and rare uh, type fonts, uh, it's more or less solved. The problem is that um, we don't have an IIM database. Uh, we don't have these big uh, handwriting uh, data sets to, to test. And each one of the uh, music uh, manuscripts that you find, you see that oof, these handwriting, I know music, fine. So I know how to read music. But when I have a manuscript from the 18 and 17 and 16 century, I don't have the possibility to read some of the of the symbols because I don't know this um, handwriting style or I don't know this particular uh, way of writing some some symbols because the standard came later. Mm -hmm. So I I think that we need somehow to incorporate the expert, and this is again where the musicology. Uh, comes. And of, I, of course, I also think that uh, multimodality uh, can help. Maybe in the same way as um, Torralba was doing in computer vision with the videos and, uh, and the sounds. So maybe it would, it would work. Yeah. Nice idea. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, you know, I always come up with crazy ideas and then it turns out that they're really difficult to implement because you have to align the data and you need synchronous recordings. And then um, if people try to do it, they start hating me. <laughs> Why did you come up with this idea? <laughs> well, but at least there is one idea to start with. That's, that's something. <laughs> well, there's uh, there's also some so also your work by the way the work on on deciphering the manuscript um, I I already took the reference and sent it to some of my colleagues uh, because they they're working on this crazy orca project where they have forty thousand hours of whale singing that has been recorded in the in the coast of Canada and wow. now they they're spotting the different orca sounds and they also uh, are actually traveling now to the to the sea and do uh, microphone array recordings of different individuals because they've been their residents. So they've been living in that area and they hope that they can piece out the different whales and then start essentially deciphering uh, sequences and call sequences of like the acoustic symbols, you could say, and uh, figure out the different individuals. And I think what you are proposing there will be very, very helpful for, for their project as well, because we are also facing this this list of symbols that we can't decipher um, but they're they acoustic events so that's that's really really cool and so far they've been looking into clustering so the simple approaches that that you've been showing but i guess that a more sophisticated approach here can uh, can help quite a bit so I'm, I'm, i would be thrilled if that also works in in animal sounds what you're proposing <laughs> So, um, there's there's a, a question here as well, and right now you're you're essentially transcribing, right? So you discover the the symbols, but you're not really automatically deciphering the do the documents, right? So this is you you're discovering the the alphabet and the recognition at the same time to to summarize the work, right? Yeah, and it would be super cool to have an integrated approach, an integrated model that takes the, the image as input and the decrypted text as output. Somehow, let's think that in the translation, so I think in translation, uh, with this sequence-to-sequence -sequence architecture, for example, typical for a translation, and then what I have is this text in Spanish, and then I have the other text in Japanese, and then I am just translating this to the other one. So I just can imagine that this input is an image. If this input is an image of uh, my house is green, 
the image, then the sequence to sequence is just reading the pixels and then at the same time uh, translating into Japanese. So it would be super nice. And this is something that we have in our to-do list uh, to explore these uh, joint uh, approaches. And of course, it's not um, easy because depending on the manuscript, uh, the cryptoanalysis part, it's so tough that uh, you don't know how to crack. So, because it's not translation, again, it's, everything is hidden, so they are even transposing uh, and swapping um, uh, characters so that the message is very, very difficult to read. So it's, it's something that we have uh, on the table as a future uh, to-do list, but it's difficult in the sense that in some cases, there are manuscripts that are even not yet uh, decrypted. Yeah, so you, you need something like the Rosetta Stone that you know that it's the same text or it has yes. the same context, right? Yes. If you, if you don't have that, you, you can only guess from distributions of characters uh, and try guessing the language or something like that. Um, yes. The, there was the Zodiac Killer in the US some, some years ago. And it took quite a lot of time to decipher all the, all the letters because there were even uh, characters in the middle just for fun. So just symbols in the middle for fun, just to make the decryption more complicated. So I can imagine that it can be, <laughs> it can be, it can be tough. But of course, I think that's very challenging. Just imagine that you have a manuscript in here and you don't know what, it, what it's written. And then with the, with the system, you can have somehow an approximation of the text that's you know, secretly encoded in here. Yeah, but you, you clearly need to, to have some kind of at least gray box model, because if you train a black box model, it, it could, you know, you, you could be generating GPT-3 like wonderful text, but it has yeah. nothing to do with your inputs, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is a really tough one. <laughs> And very exciting. I mean, it's, I, I think that's really, just imagine that we take all these manuscripts in the, in the two centuries, uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, and even the beginning of the 20th, uh, during the first world war, there were these kinds of manuscripts still going here and there before some more sophisticated techniques and technology came in. Just imagine that we can see some secret messages in the middle of, a, I don't know, a war. And then we see that maybe this was not really happening because they were trying to do uh, whatever uh, other things. So even we could reinterpret somehow uh, some events in history. That's really cool. Yeah, that's right. That also the, the information is kind of used as a means of fighting the war that you deliberately spent mis uh, spread misinformation and so on, right? And very, very, very interesting. So I also got notified here that uh, our person asking the question was very satisfied with our answer on the previous question. So <laughs> Angelos. Hi, Angelos. Um, and the, now he's asking, have you reproduced the uh, learn to read by spelling? Yeah. That's something that's on your list. Uh, yeah, we have been uh, checking this paper. And there is also another paper from the same authors that are also trying to read without any information from the alphabet. So we are following the publications from the, from the authors and they have very nice ideas. So far, uh, everything that I've seen from them are um, printed text and synthetic uh, text. Uh, so I would like to see how far we can go uh, from this. But it's true that the few shot learning uh, method that we were exploring um, based on the few shot object detection, the one that uh, we were trying to work um, with the ciphers, is a quite similar idea of the, of the methods that those authors are, are proposing. But yeah, yeah, uh, we, we are trying to get inspiration from these uh, researchers. Yep. If you are interested in collaborations, just tell us. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Alicia, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and also the, the very nice discussion here in the end. I think it was very cool to, to hear your insights on, on and also opinions on the interdisciplinary work and also some hints on the research. So I think that was very well appreciated by all the audience. Thank so you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation.
Yeah, and I have another round of applause for you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you've seen that we had a fascinating presentation here, a lot of discussion of the different methods, the different ideas that came up from analyzing documents over the importance of also having a multimodal view on this, and of course, the actual analysis of the documents. So I enjoyed the presentation as well as the discussion a lot. If you have any questions, then feel free to ask them. You can send them to me or you can post them here in the comments below the video. And I would forward them to Alicia such that you get your questions answered. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation as much as I did. And I'm very much looking forward to meet you again in another episode of Beyond the Patterns. Thank you very much for watching and bye bye.